Apparently, these small heads 
did not appear so small to them. They had my eyes checked first. They took some x-rays of my skull. Did I have migraines? Did I have pinhead fears? Dreams? Perhaps it was the angle through the windshield glass. The local doctor leaning over me with his pen light probing my retina. His head was suit, and the hairs on the back of his hands were crossed like swords. Nothing wrong with my eyes or my brain that he could tell. But the heads I swore were small were not. They were just your average heads, circa 1953. Just your average heads in America.
did not stand close to each other, and though they stared from their machine, indifferently, distantly, I do not doubt they'd known each other's heart and fears. The mustached one wore a small ring on his little Neither smiled as that instant sacred to the memory was snatched from a factory in Wilson, Kansas. Back when my grandparents were children. Prescription from an F.C. druggist made out for the worst, the worst kind of poison. And I, I could imagine how the author left the way friends or wives laugh at such love clear jokes. Never at Whitman or Plato or given thoughts to a theories of passion. Take him and kiss those quiet lips and move his hands over his chest and back and thighs. Until finally.
Welcome, my name is Stephen Daigle, Artistic Director for Eastman Opera Theater. I'm honored to introduce to you Lori Leitman, one of our six composers participating in Eastman's Our Voices. Described by Fanfare Magazine as one of the most talented and intriguing of living composers, Lori Leitman has composed multiple operas and choral works and hundreds of song settings by classical and contemporary poets, including those who perished in the Holocaust. Her music is widely performed throughout the world and has generated substantial critical acclaim. In 2016, Opera Colorado presented the world premiere of Lori's opera, The Scarlet Letter to a Libretto by David Mason. Noxus released a CD of the live performance in 2018 to critical acclaim. Quote, Leitman is one of the most prolific and fluent song and opera composers of our time with a gift for effortless melody and for getting to the emotional hearts of her text, end quote. The recording was named a Critics' Choice by Opera News and one of the top five CDs of 2018 by Fanfare Magazine. Lori is currently finishing a chamber opera titled Uncovered, based on Leah Lax's memoir, commissioned by a consortium of universities and companies led by Utah State, and is scheduled for premiere in 2022. Other prestigious commissions have come from the BBC and the Royal Philharmonic Society, Opera America, Opera Colorado, Seattle Opera, Grant Park Music Festival, Washington Master Chorale, Music of Remembrance, and the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Her works have been featured on Thomas Hampson's Song of America radio series and in the Grove Dictionary of American Music. 
Now, having the privilege to work with the Eastman students on a selected group of songs composed by Lori this fall for our voices, this quote from the Journal of Singing definitely rings true. Quote, it is difficult to think of anyone before the public today who equals her exceptional gifts for embracing a poetic text and giving it a new and deeper life through music. And we're very happy to have Lori Leitman participating in our voices. So thank am, you, Lori. Sure, I'm delighted to participate. It's been a, a wonderful experience and I'm very grateful. And I thought I would just start by asking you, what inspires you to compose songs for singers um, as compared to other genres of music? Right, well, um, let me start by saying that I had only composed one song in college and then I didn't write for The Voice again until 1991 when my old interlochen roommate, soprano Lauren Wagner won a bunch of international competitions. And one of her prizes was making a debut CD. And so she contacted me and asked me to write music songs for her. And I said, I couldn't because I didn't know how to write a song. And she just insisted. And so I began to study her repertoire and tried to figure out the songs of hers that I particularly liked, and then tried to recreate that with my first song, a setting of Sarah Teasdale's The Metropolitan Tower, which I had patterned on Paul Bowles's Secret Words. And it was in writing that first song that I discovered my compositional voice because the song came relatively easy to me. It took some work to, to you know, finesse it, but, but it sort of just sprung out of me. And that's when I realized that I had this intuitive gift for setting words to music. And as a, a mother with three small children, it was um, a thrilling moment for me to discover that I had uh, some kind of a gift. And I just wanted to keep um, recreating that. Um, I think that I did have this instinctual um, way of knowing what would work well for the voice because my mother was a singer. I came from a musical family. I was a flutist and a pianist, so I, I knew melody. I knew a good melody. And um, I had also studied writing for film and theater in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so I knew how to respond to different moods. And I often think of my poems as films, miniature films. And I am still creating film music for those films. And it is just so much easier for me to work with words than to make a piece without words because everything I do is in response to setting the words properly and creating the right mood for those words. That's why I keep writing for singers, basically. Right. It's just easier for me and something I enjoy and it's um, thrilling to discover how to figure out the answer to each puzzle that is each poem. Yeah. And words tell stories, right? So, yes. um, you know, what are the stories that you're inspired to tell through your music? Yeah, well, it, it's different uh, for my songs than for my operas. Mm -hmm. For my songs, I'm always looking for well-crafted poetry and it doesn't necessarily have to tell like a story about a character, which you have to tell an opera. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'm looking for something that's well-written and that I can connect with emotionally. and and whatever story I'm telling actually depends on what commission I'm being uh, commissioned for. So sometimes I need to tell stories about horses or sometimes I need to tell stories about childhood. I've had very, very um, many varied topics and, and a topic that is very dear to my heart is telling stories about the Holocaust mm -hmm. because um, I like to encourage empathy by telling a story about a particular individual or situation so we can all realize in the words of my poet and librettist David Mason, as he says in our oratory of Edom, we were no different than you. So for operas, it's very different. We have characters and, and I'm always looking for a good story with well-drawn characters and something that's very dramatic. I don't like a static story. I like something that moves. I love dramatic irony. But whether the story is old, as in Scarlet Letter or The Three Feathers, or new, as in Uncovered, uh, I think the themes of each are very universal and very similar. Um, the moral imperative of each is that in order to find true happiness, we have to be true to one's own nature. Yeah, wonderful. And so what would you say that, you know, it sounds like these stories, that's what influences you, your work? 
as a composer. Yeah. Um, That's right. And, yeah. I mean, yes, it's it, it, every, every musical idea, every gesture comes from the words. That's my inspiration. It's never like going to a beautiful place in nature and having a solitude or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really care where I am as long as I have a good poem. But of course, you know, growing up and spending my whole life in music, there, there were undeniable influences. When I was a child, I loved musical theater. I loved West Side Story. You know, I loved mm -hmm. Fiddler on the Roof. As a young mother, I loved Into the Woods. I was totally obsessed with Into the Woods by Sondheim. You know, I love Gershwin and I love Porter. And for classical music, a partial list, of course, it can never be a full list, it includes Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms and uh, Bach, of course, and Monteverdi and Schumann and Ravel and Schubert and Prokofiev and um, Tchaikovsky and Rossini. I love Rossini. <laughs> overtures and William Bolcom blows my mm -hmm. mind all the time and I must include my daughter Diana Rosenblum mm -hmm. who is about to finish her PhD at Eastman uh, because I learn a lot from her uh, well, and it, her, her approach is so different than mine. Well, you mentioned uh, the lyric theater how you're a fan and we can definitely see that I yeah hear it and then in, in, in your work um, and uh, I you know now maybe it's time to focus a little on the 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 Our Voices collection that um, we're doing of your songs. And, um, sure. you know, um, I, I'd love to know why um, there's relevance. Of, you know, these songs are relevant in society, our society today. Um, maybe tell us about the themes that were communi communicated from the group of songs. And we set the title of this as I Shall Not Live in Vain. And maybe you can talk about how that ties all of these songs together. Sure. So um, the themes are really very varied. And um, here's a rundown of them. It mm -hmm. ranges from the science of the brain when you're in love to the sorrow of watching a loved father descend into Alzheimer's to the skewed and comedic perceptions of a child who was diagnosed with uh, a neurological condition called Alice in Wonderland syndrome to recognizing the dignity of every homeless person, uh, to the tragedy of the Holocaust and the amazing spirit that these children who were uh, imprisoned in concentration camps showed despite their surroundings, to the burden of overwhelming depression, the beauty of hidden gay love, and the realization that helping others is the key to having a meaningful life. And that is where I shall not live in vain comes from, and it's taken from Emily Dickinson's beautiful poem, short poem, um, which I just call in my song, If I, but it is my belief that uh, this is the key to happiness, to help others and to give of yourself and to use your talents to help make the world a better place. It's, so I um... think I think that is, that's a hopeful um, theme that, that runs through everything. You know, not, not all of these stories are happy stories, mm -hmm. but even with the Alzheimer's um, or finding joy as a child in the Holocaust by, by looking or thinking about the last butterfly you saw, um, there is, I think hope is essential to, to happiness as well. Right. We definitely need that now, I think more than ever. Um, yeah, and I think it was really your creativity and that of the, the creative team and the students to find a storyline that could unify everything. I mean, I made sure that the, there was a dramatic musical arc from start mm -hmm. to finish in terms of mood and having the keys flow from one song to another, but I couldn't have envisioned what you did with it. I haven't seen it, but I've seen, you know, I know the intentions of, about what going to be seen. <laughs> and uh, I really applaud your creativity for coming up with the idea to really mesh everything together. And well, thank you, Lori. I, I, one of the, the keys for this was trying to, uh, this whole project was trying to figure out, you know, what we were going to um, do in this pandemic. And yeah. there were a few parameters that sort of set it up for me, which was, you know, I would love to get singers in a performance space, even if it means recording them. Um, and, you know, I knew that the collaboration that we would normally have for opera on the stage would not happen. It would be very difficult to put 
singers in a room unless we put masks on them. And I wanted to try to keep the parameters of, you know, the normal form of performing um, intact by not having them use masks. And, um, you know, one of the, the things we did was sort of rearrange the collaboration process instead of the singer getting involved later, getting involved earlier. Later, the singers are involved, of course, with directors and conductors and with the orchestra. And then they, they appear in front of a set. They know about the set, but they appear in front of it. Um, but what we tried to do was to have that happen early on, to have a kind of a collaborative uh, creativity session where they understood what um, you know the pieces were about, um, that you talked about the pieces, the inspiration, and meeting with a projection designer and costume designer. And they, they really did bring their stories into this uh, project. And um, I just wanted to your, uh, your impressions of the students interacting with them on this project. Excuse me, I just have to pick up and hang up this robocall. That's okay. It's stops <laughs> ringing. It happens in Zoom, Zoom conversations yeah. all the time. Yeah, so um, in answer to your question, I was so impressed by the thought and the enthusiasm and the work that each of the students put into their very detailed interpretations. You know, um, for them to create these backstories for each of the characters and each of the songs, that was so imaginative. Um, and uh, for them to take on the, uh, the roles not normally associated with just singing a piece in a recital, as you said, you know, to work um, from the start with a creative team to think about props and, and costumes and staging and lighting with the goal of illuminating each song and bringing this narrative to virtual life. Um, they were astonishing. I just am thrilled to, to see what they're gonna do and, and just, it's very, very impressive. Uh, you know, the opportunity to work with six amazing composers, um, you know, the students, and we had 30 to 40 students involved in the project was just, it was amazing for them. And I think it filled in a gap that they needed, a creative gap that, um, you know, during this time where things are sort of stagnant on the stage, um, sure. it was a very important experience that um, they're gonna associate it with this time but they're also going to associate it with something very rewarding um, yeah. experience with the, the, the composers. And all of the composers we picked um, all have their foot in song and opera. And I'm going to ask this question a little broader than just about opera, but I want to know, like, lyric theater, um, what, what role does that have in our world yeah. that, that we live in? Why is it important? We... Yeah, well, I think, unfortunately, it doesn't have as much of a role as it should have. And I think that, you know, I mean, the world is so focused on popular music rather than classical or opera, and it's unfortunate. But I do think as humans that we do have this um, need for stories and song. We've had it forever. The human voice is part of us. Music is part of us. And stories and song are the essence of opera. So my hope is that through better education, you know, starting when kids are young, um, that opera can find its way back to becoming a more popular art form that everyone can enjoy because it's enjoyable. It's also amazing that humans can sing like opera singers. I mean, it's right. it's beyond comprehension. And it's uh, athletic. <laughs> it is absolutely athletic. It's like being in the Olympics. So right. I think, you know, people have to understand that or even just, you know, any musician, there's so much training that goes in into becoming a great musician or even a mediocre musician. <laughs> there's a lot of training and people don't even realize how much effort it takes. And, and I wish that were more appreciated. But um, I think that with creative projects like you invented, like with Our Voices, that is a way I think to connect um, and um, I, uh, and to bring, you know, the, the intimacy, I guess, this is very intimate in a Zoom opera presentation, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, in some ways it might even um, make more of a connection than perhaps right. being at the back of an opera house if you're a young student and you can't afford being in the orchestra. Um, it's, uh, it's just very inventive what you've done.
Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I hope that at least it's a step for people getting interested in going to see live theater again, because Absolutely. that is that is the charge for me is that, you know, I'm, I'm missing that most of all, I think right now is to, to be in a space and kind of, you know, a live environment where you know that you're a part of something that will never happen again, exactly the way it's happening in that moment. And maybe the pandemic, who knows, um, maybe there's going to be this real need to have this sort of social gathering type of event, like going to an opera, having dinner and going out. Um, it seems to be sort of a European philosophy of making a night of it. So we need to get that spirit more in, in the United States, I think, with these stories that we tell through opera. Um, yeah. So I, 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 the last question is just, um, what? You, why did you choose to do this? Why did you? Well, uh, you asked this? me. That was the right. first thing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've literally, I've always had the highest respect for Eastman students and faculty and um because the singers and faculty I've worked with over the years that have come from Eastman have been so intelligent and thoughtful and their interpretations have always gone beyond anything superficial. It's always been, had a depth to it. So I jumped at the chance to work with the uh, stars of the future, <laughs> with the current, the current students and faculty. And I, I, I knew they would do a wonderful job. And I was very intrigued to see what could be made out of this, you know, to, to create a, a narrative from, from such varied songs. And, um, and, and again, you know, kudos to you for coming up with the idea of, of gluing it all together in a way that made sense. So I feel very grateful. So well, thanks. it was, well, thank you. It, it was an easy process considering, you know, the type of music we're presented that I think the students, um, you know, um, with, with your music and your insight through your music and with the other composers, um, there's a real depth there that allows them to, you know, respond in a way that's um, heartfelt and, um, you know, committed. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's something they're going to grab a hold on uh, to in your music and all the other comp composers as um, they continue their careers um, mm -hmm. in the opera world. So we thank you very much. The, the school thanks you and the students thank you. And we are so looking forward um, to maybe the next collaboration that we have um, when we're doing things a little bit on the normal side again, <laughs> and <laughs> where we're all able to meet and embrace and enjoy I look forward making. To, to meeting you in real life. Yes, We've that's right. <laughs> we never have met, <laughs> except through Zoom. So yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much.